When it comes to animated icons, one stands massive ears above the rest. He's known to wear many hats and perform many feats of fantasy. Heck, he can even captain a steamboat. Although these days, a lot more people can have him do that. Of course, I'm talking about the Walt Disney creation and mascot for Disney as a whole, Mickey Mouse. Just recently, after an extremely long period of time, thanks to Disney's lobbying to extend copyright protections, the original iteration of the Big Mouse has entered the public domain. So what better time to take a look at the long and illustrious history of Mickey Mouse? Welcome back to Channel Frederator. Today, we're going to put together a comprehensive timeline of how Mickey Mouse got to be where he is today. Make sure you like the video and hit subscribe if you want to see more like it. Let's get started. Before we get into it, a big shout out to the Disney Wiki, which provided most of the information in this timeline. The link is provided in the description. 1928 to 1930. Before there was Mickey Mouse or even Steamboat Willie, there was Oswald the Lucky Rabbit. Under the authority of Charles Mintz, a producer, Walt Disney signed a Universal Pictures contract to produce a series of cartoons featuring Oswald. Along with Disney's longtime collaborator, Ub Iwerks, they put together the show. The series was a hit with audiences, gaining traction relatively quickly. However, the relationship between Disney and Universal took a hit. Iwerks found out that Mintz's assistant, George Winkler, had been hiring away Disney's animators behind his back. When Disney tried to negotiate a more profitable contract, Mintz suggested a 20% cut instead. This was enough to make Disney quit. On the train ride back to California, Walt Disney brainstormed new ideas for a cartoon character in order to keep his studio going. He came up with a mouse, who he believed would be sympathetic and cute. He also figured that mice hadn't been overused in movies, which would make his mouse stand out. The name he came up with was Mortimer Mouse, which, while cute, wasn't quite good enough. His wife suggested Mickey, and the rest was history. Walt Disney sketched the mouse out to get a basic idea down, and had Ub take a look to refine the character. Mickey looked a lot like a lot of cartoon characters at the time, Felix the Cat and Disney's own Oswald. Iwerks was quoted about this design philosophy. Pear-shaped body, ball on top, a couple of thin legs, you give it long ears and it was a rabbit, short ears it was a cat. With an elongated nose, it became a mouse. And a long nose he got. Disney, Iwerks, and a handful of others interested in helping worked on the first two Disney cartoons in secret while completing the contractually required Oswald cartoons for Universal. First up was the short Plain Crazy, which screened for test audiences on May 15th, 1928. This short showed Mickey attempting to become an aviator in the style of Charles Lindbergh. Interestingly enough, Mickey kept more of his animal features here, not wearing shoes or gloves and looking more like a mouse than in more modern designs. Mickey is also much more arrogant and rash, even antagonizing Minnie. Plain Crazy did not find a distributor and was not released that year. Next was the Gallopin' Gaucho, which introduced Mickey's signature shoes and made him a more noble and heroic character. In this short, Mickey embarks on a chase to save Minnie from the villainous Pete, who would end up being a regular throughout the Mickey timeline. This one also did not get released to the public that year. The short that really made Mickey a household name was Steamboat Willie, styled after Buster Keaton's Steamboat Bill Jr. For this short, Walt Disney wanted to try out the talkie style. Sound had been used in cartoons before this, but Steamboat Willie really committed. The dialogue in this short was mostly squeaks, yelps, and other mousy noises. Before Steamboat Willie, Mickey was largely a pantomime character, often communicating via on-screen text. This story featured Mickey as the deckhand on the steamboat commanded by Pete. Near the climax, Mickey conducts a performance of the song Turkey and the Straw. Naturally, people went crazy for it. This short also made Mickey more appealing in both design and personality. Mickey and Minnie were both voiced by Walt Disney, a casting choice that would continue for years down the line. Steamboat Willie was indeed picked up by distributors and released on November 18, 1928 at Universal's Colony Theater in New York City, to critical acclaim. Even though it was the third short made by Disney and his collaborators, it was the first to see the light of day, making November 18th Mickey's birthday, according to archivist Dave Smith. Thanks to the success of Steamboat Willie, the first two shorts were eventually picked up and distributed, remastered with sound. Plenty more Mickey Mouse shorts would follow, largely featuring him as a rascal living in a barn-like setting of some sort. The plots were simple, with the majority of the runtime usually dedicated to musical numbers and rubber hose gags, involving characters and inanimate but anthropomorphic objects. These new shorts through 1929 helped develop Mickey's character even further. He gained his trademark white gloves in the Opry House, making him easier to animate. He gained a new bestie and Horace horse collar in the Plowboy, with Minnie getting one too. Then, Mickey spoke his first words in the Carnival Kid. 
This phrase, hot dog, would eventually become his catchphrase. Carl Stalling voiced Mickey in this particular short. He also sang an original song called Minnie's Yoo Hoo and Mickey's Follies, and this tune would become a recurring score. I recommend you check this one out in your own time, it is fascinating. These shorts launched Mickey Mouse into the spotlight, and with fame comes merchandising. Disney was offered $300 for the right to feature Mickey on a pencil tablet for children. The Mickey Mouse Club was subsequently launched by Disney in 1929. Also, in June of 1929, J.V. Connolly of King Features Syndicate proposed that Mickey make his newspaper debut in the form of a Mickey Mouse comic strip. 1930 to 1950. In late January of 1930, Mickey Mouse made it into the funny pages, written by Disney and illustrated by iWorks. The first strip was another pilot-themed escapade, with Mickey dreaming of being like Charles Lindbergh. By the summer, it had been featured in up to 40 newspapers worldwide. In May, the comics would be taken over by Disney artist Floyd Gottfredson, who would become well known for the comic strips. These strips, along with merchandising of Mickey, contributed to his worldwide appeal. The first iteration of Pluto, Mickey's pet dog, would also be introduced in 1930 in the short The Chain Gang. In 1932, at the 5th Academy Awards, Mickey was nominated for the first time for Mickey's Orphans. Disney was also awarded an honorary award for creating Mickey. The Academy Award winner that year was Disney's Technicolor cartoon Flowers and Trees, which led to Mickey making his color debut soon after. He starred in Parade of the Award Nominees, a short made for that year's Academy Awards banquet. For his first full-color role, he wore yellow gloves, green shorts, and shoes. Even though there was color in the parade short, Mickey continued to appear in black and white cartoons. One notable example, Mickey's Review, introduced an early iteration of Goofy, then known as Dippy Dog. Mickey's popularity only grew from there, and Disney produced Mickey's gala premiere, where he rubbed elbows with a handful of Hollywood stars. He even guest starred in Hollywood Party, making him the only animated character to appear in that crossover flick. Heck, Mickey even got his own balloon in the Macy's Thanksgiving Day Parade, becoming the third pop culture character to have a licensed balloon. Donald Duck first appeared alongside Mickey in the 1934 cartoon Orphan's Benefit, acting as a foil to Mickey and allowing Disney to add some more attitude to their work. Mickey was under scrutiny by the public and they wanted to keep him away from Taboo to keep him squeaky clean. In 1934, Clarence Nash voiced Mickey in the short The Dog Napper, as Walt Disney was in Europe and thus unable to record his lines. Nash would also return to voice Mickey in some 50s shorts. Joe Twerp, great name by the way, would also voice Mickey in the 1938 broadcasts of the Mickey Mouse Theater of Air. Even though Mickey starred in a color cartoon for the Academy Awards, it wasn't until 1935's The Band Concert that he appeared in an official color cartoon. He acts as a struggling conductor of a public band concert and things go noticeably sideways thanks to Donald Duck and a tornado. Even though the color cartoon was well received, two more black and white Mickey cartoons were released in 1935. Mickey's Service Station, a comedy featuring Mickey, Donald, and Goofy together, and Mickey's Kangaroo, which would end up being the last of Mickey's black and white cartoons. Mickey's looks changed quite a bit with the introduction of color. His body became more pear-shaped, and his eyes took on a little more definition. His nose was also made a little shorter. With great power comes great responsibility, and with great fame comes great complainers. Parents started to complain about Mickey's flawed behavior, and so Disney decided to keep his later cartoons a little more family-friendly. Interestingly enough, this caused Mickey's popularity to fall a bit, even resulting in him being left out of some Mickey, Donald, and Goofy shorts, starting with Polar Trappers in 1938. Walt Disney wanted to bring Mickey back into the spotlight, and planned on advancing his acting abilities and the sophistication of his roles. Fred Moore was brought on to help broaden Mickey's range through a new design. This new design was first used in the deluxe short, The Sorcerer's Apprentice, based on the 1797 poem and its 1897 orchestral adaptation. It was a sort of crossover between animation and classical music, similar to Silly Symphonies. While Disney worked on The Sorcerer's Apprentice, the redesigned Mickey would also show up in Mickey's Surprise Party and the Academy Award-nominated short, The Pointer. The costs to create The Sorcerer's Apprentice jumped up to $125,000, which was almost quadruple what it usually cost to make a silly symphony. Because of this, Disney decided to expand it to a full feature film in order to recoup some of the money to make it. It ended up becoming Fantasia, Disney's third animated film after Snow White and Pinocchio. Even though it is beloved today, it didn't fare so well upon release. Mickey's decline continued, as Fantasia was critically and financially underwhelming. 
Folks figured that Mickey was too complex of a character for just anyone to do justice. Walt Disney was now more involved in feature films, leaving others to put together shorts. This, paired with Mickey's status as a Western hero, meaning no smoking, drinking, or violence, made him difficult to gag around with. This wasn't the end for Mickey in the world of shorts, however. A 1941 Mickey Mouse short, Lend a Paw, was the only Mickey short to ever win an Academy Award, Best Animated Short. Animators Bill Cottrell and Thornton He pushed for a feature film based on Jack and the Beanstalk with Mickey in the role of Jack. Disney shot down the pitch, but Cottrell and He did eventually convince him to go ahead with it. This resulted in Mickey appearing in his second feature film, Fun and Fancy Free, in the Mickey and the Beanstalk segment. This would also be Jimmy McDonald's first performance as the voice of Mickey, although he did work alongside Walt Disney for this one. Disney was often too busy performing other duties to voice Mickey, and it's also said that his smoking habit may have impacted his ability to do voiceover work, especially in falsetto. 1950 to 2000, Mickey got modernized as the world approached the latter half of the century. His design now included eyebrows, which would stick around until the late 80s to 90s. As the 50s kicked off, the end was near for Mickey's theatrical run. 56 more color cartoons were released in the original theatrical series, finishing off with The Simple Things in 1953, which was a day with Mickey and Pluto at the beach. With that wrapped up, Mickey would stay off the big screen for a while. That didn't mean he was gone, though. Of course, he was still the face of Disney's merchandising and Disney as a whole. For Mickey's 25th anniversary, Paul Hench created a commemorative portrait of the mouse, a tradition that would continue with all sorts of major Mickey anniversaries. Stan Freberg voiced Mickey in a 1954 Disney record called Walt Disney's Mickey Mouse's Birthday Party. Mickey Mouse also made the transition to the small screen in the 50s, with Walt Disney debuting the Mickey Mouse Club TV show. Along with the show came Jimmy Dodd's Mickey Mouse March, which became Mickey's theme song. Disneyland opened in 1955, and of course, Mickey was there to help. He remains the ambassador of the park to this day. The classic mouse ear hats also made their first appearance at this park as well, and have since made their way pretty much everywhere in the world. In 1974, Alan Young would voice Mickey in the album, an adaptation of Dickens' Christmas Carol, and this would be Young's only time voicing him. In 1978, to honor Mickey's 50th anniversary, he became the first animated character to have a star on the Hollywood Walk of Fame. He would also appear at the 50th Academy Awards ceremony to help announce the winner for Best Short Film Animated. In 1983, Mickey finally made his theatrical comeback, appearing in his first theatrical short since The Simple Things. It was a take on A Christmas Carol called Mickey's Christmas Carol, and Mickey played the role of Bob Cratchit opposite Scrooge McDuck's Ebenezer Scrooge. Mickey also debuted a new voice actor, Wayne Allwine. In the late 80s, around the time of Mickey's 60th anniversary, Disney kicked off an initiative to bring some classic characters back into the spotlight. Here, Les Perkins voiced Mickey in two TV specials. Wayne Allwine and Perkins would alternate for TV roles, and Pete Renaday played Mickey on albums and for toys. There was also a planned series of short animated productions, like The Prince and the Popper, Swabies, and Mickey Columbus, but only The Prince and the Popper made it to the public, as a featurette ahead of The Rescuers Down Under in 1990. Allwine was the sole voice of Mickey by 1987, with the formation of Disney Character Voices International, and remained so until his death in 2009. From here, Mickey continued to be the face of Disney, but didn't do much besides make cameo appearances. He showed up for the opening and closing sequences of the Disney Afternoon Block that aired on Disney's television networks in the 1990s, interacting with other Disney characters. There was also a new theatrical cartoon short called Runaway Brain, in which Mickey's brain and body are switched with that of a monster, and this one screened ahead of a kid in King Arthur's court. The gang also made a big comeback when the Mickey Mouse Works series of shorts premiered in 1999, led by Roy E. Disney, Walt's nephew. These shorts were styled after Disney's golden age of animation and showed off Mickey getting himself into trouble. There was also a 90 second umbrella title, Mickey to the Rescue, and a series of mouse tail cartoons which had Mickey as the protagonist in adaptations of classic tales. 2000 to 2020. With Mouse Works all wrapped up, a new Mickey based show was produced House of Mouse. This crossover sitcom saw Mickey managing a club frequented by characters from throughout Disney's history. This hit screens in early 2001 and ran for three seasons, also developing two straight-to-DVD movies. In a very 2000s move, Mickey was also considered for the main character role in a Squaresoft video game. Donald Duck was also in the running, but neither ended up as the protagonist. They did, however, play supporting roles along with Goofy and a bunch of other characters from Disney properties in what would eventually become Kingdom Hearts. 
Mickey finally got to star in a non-compilation feature-length film in 2004. Mickey, Donald, Goofy, The Three Musketeers was a direct-to-video musical adaptation of the novel, and follows the trio on their quest to save Minnie from Pete. He also made the transition to computer animation in 2004, making an appearance in Mickey's Twice Upon a Christmas. Mickey Mouse Clubhouse arrived on the scene in 2006 as an interactive children's show and popularized Mickey's catchphrase, Hot Dog, with a tune by They Might Be Giants. This show ran for four seasons on Playhouse Disney and Disney Junior and concluded in 2016. After Allwine's death in 2009, Brett Iwin inherited the role. There are even a couple spin-offs, like Mickey and the Roadster Racers, aka Mickey Mouse Mixed Up Adventures, Mickey Mouse Funhouse, and a revival of the original Mickey Mouse Clubhouse set to debut in 2025. 2009 saw Mickey hit up the Macy's Thanksgiving Parade again, dressed up as the captain in Tugboat Willie. Disney also looked to rebrand Mickey around this time, doubling down on his mischievous side rather than committing to his pleasant and cheerful self. This was elaborated upon in the video game Epic Mickey, where Mickey and his predecessor Oswald the Lucky Rabbit interacted on screen for the very first time. By 2013, Mickey was due for yet another redesign, and soon appeared along with all of his friends in the Mickey Mouse series of short, headed by animator Paul Rudish. This series took inspiration from Mickey's earliest cartoons and allowed some of his flaws to come through, while also keeping him nice and wholesome. Chris Diamantopoulos voices Mickey in this series. The Mickey Mouse series was a major success, earning many Emmy and Annie awards for writing, music, voice work, and animation. It also inspired a spin-off called The Wonderful World of Mickey Mouse for Disney+. Mickey even crossed the barrier between traditional and CGI animation in the short Get a Horse, which screened ahead of Frozen. This short, where he's removed from his 2D world by Pete, has him fight Pete across dimensions to rescue Minnie, and also earned Mickey his 10th Oscar nom at the 86th Academy Awards. In 2018, Mickey celebrated his 90th anniversary, and Disney celebrated with a widespread campaign called Mickey, the True Original. This highlighted his career and how he impacted pop culture ever since Steamboat Willie. There was a two-hour special on ABC celebrating his 90th as well, with plenty of musical numbers and guest stars. There was even a pop-up art exhibit hosted in New York City to celebrate this as well, followed up by similar exhibits in Seoul, Hong Kong, Malaysia, Dubai, and South Africa. 2020 to 2024. Using the version of Mickey and Minnie from Paul Rudish's shorts, Walt Disney World created the first Mickey Mouse-themed dark ride, Mickey and Minnie's Runaway Railway. Mickey appears in the ride itself as an animatronic and in an animated musical short ahead of the ride. There's even an original song, Nothing Can Stop Us Now. Mickey returned to TV as a cameo animated by Eric Goldberg on Dancing with the Stars for the show's 30th season. They featured a Disney Week event. Then in 2022, a Mickey Mouse documentary was released on Disney+, Plus. Mickey, the Story of a Mouse. This was accompanied by a hand-drawn animated short called Mickey in a Minute, where he travels through all sorts of his cartoons. Also in 2022, a series of Mickey and Friends-focused Chibi Tiny Tales shorts were released. On October 15th, in celebration of 100 years of Disney, a short called Once Upon a Studio premiered on ABC, and was released on Disney Plus the next day. Here we see Mickey get all sorts of Disney characters together for a big group photo. And with that, we're all up to date on the life and times of Mickey Mouse. A cartoon classic, a merchandising megaforce, and an all-around cool character. Who could have seen all this coming? Now, before you head out, just know, although Steamboat Willie is now in the public domain, you can't just go around using Mickey however you please. Only the black and white whistling Steamboat worker can be used for other creative ventures, so just don't put gloves on him. What did you think of the video? Did you learn anything new about Mickey and his pals? Were any of his designs over the years surprising to you? Which Mickey is your favorite Mickey? Are you excited for 2028, 100 years of Mickey? Make sure you let us know down in the comments and subscribe to Channel Frederator for more like this. Thanks for watching, and remember, Frederator loves you.